Awesome, awesome. Well, thank you for having me again. I'm not a friend here. I, I consider myself family, so if you don't think I'm family, that's okay. I think I'm family, so it's all right. So, uh, man, I, I sat and did uh, so many things inside this church. I sat on those chairs and listened to, I think, the greatest preacher. I'm not lying. I, I think he is the greatest communicator in the country. I've seen a lot, and so... Um, he never says that, like, because it's just saying who he is, but I can say it because I believe it. So anyway, but I love him. I love him, uh, his family, Tara. Everything we do, I was telling her last night, like, everything my wife does inside of our family is from Tara Lee. And so she is a spiritual mom to us. Um, he's a spiritual father in my, in my life. And I know many of you in here, you guys are all friends to me, but we're all family. We're going to have a good time today. So hey, if you have your Bibles, open up to Luke chapter 22 is where we're going to be in today. Luke chapter 22. And uh, how many of y'all ever heard this uh, really churchy word called? faith. Anybody ever heard that word called faith? Yeah, because when you like start in church, one of the first words you learn is faith, because really you need faith to follow God. And you hear all of these great thoughts about faith and ethereal feelings about faith, and you think you know what it's like, and you kind of wish you thought you... So when, even when people ask you, like, what is faith, you have... Everybody has a different definition of it. And so today, I thought I would take the idea of what faith is and really bring out what Scripture talks about it through the eyes of Jesus and through the life of Jesus, and really uh, maybe teach us something about what we call this thing called faith. And so Luke chapter 22 is where we're going to be. But before we get in there, I'll just give you some context uh, really quick so the scriptures that we're about to be in. Luke chapter 22 is kind of towards the end of Jesus' ministry. He's in this place called the, uh, the Garden of Gethsemane, and he's at the end of his life. So Jesus lived on this earth 33 years, 30 years. He uh, was, you know, he lives. He has a three-year ministry. This is kind of towards the end of his three-year ministry. He realizes that there's about uh, to happen a ton of negative things because, of course, he's God, Jesus on the earth. He knows, he knows what's coming. And so there is a moment in the Garden of Gethsemane that the Bible uh, basically records for us and shows us what what Jesus has to do in his moment of toughest pain. So Luke chapter 22, uh, we pick it up in verse 39, and I think we'll put it up on the scriptures, and so we'll just kind of, on the screens, here we go, we'll read it. It says, and he came out and went, as was his custom, to the Mount of Olives, and the disciples followed him. It goes on to say, and when he came to the place, he said to them, pray that you may not enter into temptation. Now, what he was doing was he, was he knew something was coming up, and he said, hey, I want you to pray and be with me in this because there's something about to happen. And it goes on to say, and he withdrew from them about a stone's throw and knelt down and prayed. And it goes on to say, that saying, Father, if you are willing, remove this cup from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but yours be done. And there approach, appeared to him an angel from heaven, strengthening him, which is always good because in our moments we need God to send us something sometimes. And being in agony, he prayed more earnestly, and his sweat became like great drops of blood falling to the ground. And it goes on to say, when he rose from prayer, he came to the disciples and found them sleeping for sorrow. And he said to them, why are you sleeping? I thought you were here with me. You, you, you fell asleep. We were supposed to be in this together. You were boys. What happened? I thought, we were t I thought you understood that this is the, the toughest part of my life. And he says, rise and pray that you may not enter into temptation. While he was still speaking, there came a crowd and a man called Judas, one of the 12 was leading them. And he drew near to Jesus to kiss him. So he knew that, Hey, the person that was going to betray him, in fact, you want the Bible actually says earlier that whoever's going to betray him would betray him with a, a kiss. And so this is obviously just fulfillment of scripture. But Jesus said to him, Jesus, would you betray the son of man with a kiss? Judas, would you betray the son of man with a kiss? And when those were around him, saw him what would follow, they said, Lord, shall we strike the sword? So what they realize is at this moment, wait, the, the setting is now changing. They realize that something's about to happen. And so one of the disciples, we find out later, is Peter. And one of the stru them struck the servant of the high priest and cut off his right ear. And this is what's interesting. Jesus said, no more of this. And he touched his ear and he healed him. It's interesting. In the moment when somebody's hurting, he touches the ear and he, and he healed him. And we find out that Jesus is, does and acts and maybe is a little different than, than who we are in life, maybe in our toughest moments. So with that backdrop as, a, as, as our scripture today, I'm going to talk to you a little about uh, a title of my message is Jesus-like faith. Because remember this idea of faith, because you might think you know what it is, and we might think we understand what faith is, but Jesus really outlines what faith looks like in our toughest moments and with that, let's pray. God, we love you. Lord, thank you that, that we're here today. And Jesus, we want to encounter you. And Holy Spirit, I pray that today as we, as we look inside of the life of Jesus, that we could see and maybe pull out not just principles, but we could pull out your spirit that could live inside of us. Because it's in the moment of our pressing, and it's in the moment of our stress and our problems that what's inside of us comes out. And I pray that we would put Jesus inside of us so that when we are pressed, you would come out in all of our moments, God. 
Lord. And finally, we pray for the Giants to fix whatever is wrong and for the Dubs to win today. In Jesus' name. And everybody said, Amen. Amen. I, uh, I'm wearing Giants. I, I have Giants socks on because I'm from the Bay. This is home, y'all. I'm, like, I'm living in Texas. I'm in Babylon trying to convert people. <sighs> How many of y'all married in here? Raise your hand. You're married. All right, married. So y'all feel my pain. Um, when I, was, I first got married, Pastor Todd actually married Erica and I, and um, I remember, you know, right before we got married, we, uh, you know, you start to figure out things over time about who you're about to marry. And uh, one thing I didn't realize about my wife is that, um, and maybe you're like this, guys, but when you get married, there's so many little things that happened at night with women that you just don't know anything about until you live with them, you know? And so, um, but when I, 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 when I first got married, I... Uh, we, we used to live in an apartment, and uh, you know, and, and obviously you guys know this. Uh, housing is very expensive inside the Bay Area. But one of the things I had inside of my heart, and it's a it's a soul wound I have for some reason. But one of the things I always wanted to give my wife to show that I give her a home is a place with a hallway. I wanted her to have a a, a apartment with a hallway. If it had a hallway, it was a home in my mind. And so we finally got her a, a, a apartment with with a with a hallway. And so um, if you guys don't know anything about me, I'm blind as 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 blind can get. I wear a contacts and I'm at like the very far end of contacts where like they don't make contacts anymore for my eyesight. I'm at the end. And so, um, but I remember if I take my contacts out, I am blind. And at night I'm even more blind. So I'm literally, I cannot see anything at night if I take my contacts out. And so uh, when we were younger, we, we had our first apartment and at night, I don't know if you're like me guys, but I like to stay up. I'm a little bit of a night owl. And so my wife would go to bed early and I would stay up and I'd watch anything that was on TV. And typically we were like infomercials about, you know, know, ShamWow or the Mighty Putty or whatever it was, you know, and I would watch and I love as seen on TV things primarily because of that. And so one night I'm up late, my wife goes to bed, she kisses me, and I'm like, hey babe, I'll see you later. And so uh, I'm watching, you know, something on, you know, Scrub Daddy or something like that. And so uh, I'm, I, I finish up and inside of our house, inside of our apartment, there was only one bathroom and the bathroom was in the middle of the hallway. And then our room was at the end of the hallway. So I get to the bathroom, I take out my contacts. Again, I can't see. So I take them out and I, I turn the lights off. And for some reason, the person who invented or design this place, the light switch for the hallway was right there. So I had to walk and you feel, you all know what I'm talking about when you're, you're, when you can't see, you feel, so I turn the light off and I'm walking down the hallway and I get towards the end and I open the door and I'm not kidding you. So as I open the door, now, before I tell you what happened, I need you to know something. I'm afraid of the dark. <laughs> Is anybody else afraid of the dark willing to just admit I'm afraid of the dark? Okay. Don't judge me. Okay, about being afraid of the dark, because I just believe, and I just, it's just how, who I am. I just believe that there is a real Satan and devil. I really believe, and I believe he has demons, and I think that he's after me in a lot of ways. And so I just think that at night, that's when he works, and I think if he's going to come after anybody, it's going to be me. Because I'm a pastor and I work at a church and I'm going to be trying to help people. And so I think that I'm perpetually attacked by Satan. And I think as soon as the lights go out and I can't see, he's after me. Okay, so that's the backdrop of who I am as a person. Okay, this is like eight years ago, but this is still who I am as a person. I wish I could tell you that I'm, I'm better, but I'm not. And if you judge me, that's okay because I judge you. So anyway... <laughs> So I get to the door and I push the door open and you know the ding when the door opens up and it creaks, it makes that weird, creepy Halloween creak thing, it kind of opens up. It like kind of creaked open and we had a window that shone the, for some reason, <clears throat> and this is how I remember it, there was the moonlight shining in and it was hitting our bed just like right at the right moment <clears throat> and uh, first I can, I'm, I'm telling you, I feel like I remember there was mist in our room or something. <laughs> Like you can kind of see the beams of light. And so I walk in and I stop and I can see my, again, because I can't see, I can see shadows. So I see the shadow of, of the bed and there's a bump. And all of a sudden I walk and I take one step in and I, I look and, I, and I, the door is creaking open. And then all of a sudden my wife, okay, because I remember I've only been married for like a year. And so my wife, she levitates. I'm not kidding you. She like, <laughs> le, like halfway, you know, she just up out of the bed. And then she turns her head to me and I can see it. I can see it. she turns her head to me and she goes, she starts moving the sheets around the bed. And I'm like, at this point, I'm trying to be, you know, godly, you know? So I'm like, Lord, you are more than enough. You're an overcomer. You can protect me. And she's moving the sheets around the bed. And I'm like, what's going on? What's she doing? And all of a sudden she goes, she goes, Aaron, the babies, 
And I was like, at this moment, I'm like, she's, she, this is it. God, Satan's got her. She's, she's possessed. This is it. This is, this is the moment where, and so, you know, like she's, she's like, and she goes, and she stops and she goes, Aaron, the, the baby. And she starts moving the sheets around and pushing things around. And I'm like, this is, I don't know what I'm doing. Again, I can't really see. And so she goes, she goes, and then all of a sudden she screams like a bloody murder, crazy scream. She goes, ah, and then she hits the bed and goes back to sleep. And I, I was standing there and I was like, and I did what every good Christian, godly believer, Jesus is more than enough, believe in guy did, right? It would, I did everything that I, I closed that door and I slept on the couch. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Because like, I don't know, that freaked me out. But you know, why do I tell you that story? The reason I tell you that story is because like, you ever heard this statement? If you've never been in church before, you've, you've even heard this, but like, because we Christians, because if you're not a Christian here, I'm, I'm so glad you're here because like, we, we say statements like this. We say, we go, we go, you, we must live by faith and not by what? By sight, right? Yeah, we should live by faith, not by sight. Because here's the problem with that is that's a really great slogan until you can't see. And what I found is, is that my life is a lot like that story, is that I am really full of faith when I can see where I'm going. I am really full of faith when I know how things are going to end up. When my contacts are in and I can see and the light is on and my wife is awake and not talking in her sleep and possessed by who knows who. I'm full of faith, but when I can't see and I don't know what's going on, and when the pressure is on, it's really hard for me to be full of faith. Anybody else in here feel that tension in life? Isn't that a tension that we, because like if we want to just be real, let's be real. It's hard to be a Christian sometimes in a world where there's just tough things going on. But the Bible is clear that if we as Christians, we as followers of Christ, we as people who all call ourselves disciples, we must live by faith and not by sight. It's faith that pleases God. And that ultimately, it's faith that actually catches the attention of God. So what is this idea of faith? Let me give you a simple definition of what I feel faith really is. Well, as I see it in Scripture and as we kind of unpack what it is, the simplest definition of faith is truly agreement with God. It's that you believe God is who he said he was and can do what he said he can do. It's simply that you align your belief system and the way that you live and how you think and how you believe that God is who he said he was and can do what he said he can do. Faith at its core principle of who it is, it's agreement with God. It's agreeing that God is bigger than maybe any of your situations. And if you look throughout throughout Scripture, most of the time you'll see, you'll actually see that it's faith that catches the attention of God. It's not obedience. Religious people and churches all around the country would love to tell you, if you're good enough, then God will catch, you will catch the attention of God and then you'll be blessed. But if you look at the scriptures, even as Jesus was on this earth, if you look in Matthew chapter 8, it starts with an amazing story. (coughs) He comes off of the the Sermon of the Mount. He comes down and he sees a leper. And the leper says, Jesus, if you just speak, you you can heal me. And Jesus says, man, this is amazing. Your faith has made you whole. And it's it's, it's, it's the ability for Jesus to speak. Then you go a little bit further on. And he says, Jesus meets a centurion soldier who actually was a pagan man who didn't even believe in the things of Jesus. But he says to Jesus, he says, Jesus, if you would just say the words, if you would just actually say the words about my servant who's hurt, you can actually heal him because you have authority. And I understand just like I got authority, you got authority over sickness and death. If you just, if you just speak it and the Bible goes on to say that Jesus said, I've never seen such great faith and his, it was his faith, not his obedience that actually healed his servant. If you keep going a little further, there was this lady who actually ran through the crowd and touched the hem of his garment. So now Jesus didn't even have to say anything. He didn't have to touch anything. All she did was touch the cloak or the hem of his garment, the seat seat of what, of the rabbi, the the actual anointing of what it was. And it healed the blood and the the bleeding of, of everything that she was going. And he turned around and he said, something happened to me. He goes, the, the, he goes, it's your faith that has made you, not your obedience. And so it's faith that's the thing that really catches the attention of God. And if that's the case, then we need to know what kind of faith we need to have because you and I are going to go through something in that tension where we can't see and we have to live by faith. And if we, if we don't have the faith of Jesus, we're not going to be able to get what really is the accomplishment of, of our life, the purpose of our life. Because Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane on Thursday, it was what he did on Thursday. It was what he did in the garden that allowed him to have his resurrection, his purpose-filled moment on Sunday. It was what he did in the pressure moments when the lights were off. Y- y'all hearing me? You see, you see what I'm saying? It's when you, didn't, when you don't know where you're going, when you can't feel it and it doesn't feel right, 
It's what you do in those moments that produce what happens on Sunday. So I'm going to give you four types of Jesus-like faith, four types of Jesus-like faith, that if we can align our lives like this, what are the characteristics of this, um, we can get what we, what we ultimately are, are, God has given us. So number one, collective faith. That Jesus has this collective faith inside of the Garden of Gethsemane. I'm going to read it for you if you, if you have it. Bible, Luke chapter 22, and it says, And he came out and went, as was his custom, to the Mount of Olives, and his disciples followed him. So he didn't go into a place alone. He went with somebody. It was this idea that Jesus knew that for him to accomplish what he was going to accomplish in this world, he needed to go with somebody together. You and I are not absent. We cannot feel like, this is something that just we need to come to grips with in the idea, that there are only things that are going to come, come to pass in our life. We're only going to get through some areas of our life as long as we have people with us. There are different personalities in this church. You, you might be a personality, I'm an introverted person, I don't, I don't really like people, people, or you might have had maybe a history of people where you've been hurt many, many times, and you've given up on the idea of being around people. But Jesus shows us inside of this area that if Jesus couldn't go into his toughest moment and get breakthrough alone, he had to go with somebody. If Jesus, God on this earth couldn't do it, you and I can do it. That's the truth. That there is a power in this idea of collective faith. Matthew chapter 13 says an uh, uh, amazing story where Jesus is walking around. He's in the min- middle of his ministry, and he actually proves the opposite of this point, that he goes into his hometown, his hometown of Nazareth, and the Bible literally says that it was their collective lack of faith, not obedience, not their goodness, not how many Bible scriptures they read. It was their collective lack of faith that actually hindered the healing power of Jesus in that region. And if you actually fast forward inside of the Bible, Mark chapter 2 tells a great story where Jesus is teaching inside of this house and there was a sick man and he couldn't actually get himself through his tough moments to the feet of Jesus. And what happened? He had friends who actually dropped him down into the feet of Jesus and their collective lack of, the guy probably is like, man, I can't even get there. And it was their faith that he borrowed that got him to Jesus that got him through his breakthrough. So if you and I need to understand and realize that actually going through life, there are going to be things that you go up against. There's going to be gardens that you're in, moments where you can't see and moments where you feel pressure. And the only way that you can get past them is really when you have somebody around you who believes on your behalf. And that's the truth, that we need somebody's faith. Sometimes you just, I always talk about it like this, I say, you need to just borrow someone else's faith sometimes. Like you just, where you just don't believe. And I'm like, Pastor, I don't believe. I say, okay, you don't have to believe. Use somebody else's belief. To get you to where you need to go. What does this look like? You know, practically for us inside churches, there's, there's so many mechanisms for that to happen. But truthfully, a group, a small group, an area where you can collect and connect together, uh, a band of brothers, maybe it's a, a, you know, a men's breakfast, maybe it's a friendship, maybe it's you guys going out and doing something together, but it's something where you're building your life around it. You know, for me, it was uh, in this in the season of life that I'm in, it's mentors, it's guys who are, were able to get me past the moment. You know, moving to San Antonio has been um, everything that I, uh, completely opposite of what I thought it would be. Anybody ever have those moments where you had a thought of what it was going to be and then it never turned out that way? You know, like you're married or you have kids or something, you know, and you wake up and you're like, who is this person that I committed my life to, you know? Or, you know, you have a child and you're like, I don't even understand how I made you. You are not from me, you know? This is not what I thought it was. And San Antonio has been so much of that in my life and, 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 and I have not been able to get, I would stand here to say that I couldn't get through it unless I had people around me who just believed in me and believed in what I was doing and believed in the calling in my life more than I did. Because truthfully, I was trying to find ways to like, man, you know, I could probably go work at the shoe store in the mall. I think I could do really well at Carl's Jr. I really like that place. I could do some, you know, I could go back and maybe Pastor Todd will take me back at, at New Beginning. I, I mean, I want... Because the moments of stress and pressure reveal in a lot of us our weaknesses and pulls out what's really inside of us. And I remember, you know, a few weeks ago calling your pastor, my pastor, and just asking him, is this, I can't do this. And it was his faith in me that kept me going without somebody in your camp, in your corner, to have a collective belief system for you on your behalf. Many of us are missing out on, I think, our purpose in life. 
not getting through. You said, man, I, I'm just stuck in this rut. I'm stuck in this issue. I'm stuck in my garden. You know, maybe the way that God is trying to reveal to you that to get out of your garden, stop asking God for help. You might need to ask someone in your circle of life for help. The Bible talks about how we confess our sins to Jesus for uh, our, you know, our, li- our, our, our eternity and for our salvation, but really it's our confessing amongst each other that brings about true healing. And so there might be healing in your life that you can really only get as long as you have community around you. Jesus shows us that we need people. You're going to need people. Number two, submitted faith. The Bible says in verse 42, it says, saying, Father, if you are willing, remove this cup from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but yours be done. It's interesting how he pray, Jesus prays, God, I want you to, and I love the humanity of Jesus in here. This actually scripture speaks to me primarily because it's the, it's the same prayer I've been praying for like the last six months. God, could you stop? Could you fix it? This is not right. Anybody going through something right now? Just raise your hand. If you're going through some, you have some issue, big or small, raise your hand. No, keep it up. No, come on, come on, keep it up. All right, look around, okay? Anybody who's not raising their hand, you, you got amnesia. Because at the end of the day, everybody's going through something. And no one wakes up going, God, give me another problem today. Come on. Let's do it. Get, let, give me your biggest one. Let me get, to, I, I'm not dealing with enough issues right now in my job, with my kids, with my wife, with my house, with my neighbors, with my, with, with my car, whatever. God, send me something. We pray the opposite. We love to pray the first part of this prayer. God, if you can remove it, get rid of it. But the truth is Jesus doesn't stop there. Small faith says, Father, if you're willing, remove this cup from me. Big faith, Jesus-like faith, I think Christ-like faith says, but Nevertheless, not my will, but your will. So we pray the first part of the prayer a lot. But do we get to the end of the prayer where he goes, actually, but God, if, if nothing ever changes, not my will, your will be done. God, if no matter what happens in my life, if the circumstance never, ever, 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 ever changes, you know, and I'm not going anywhere. I got, nothing, I got no place to go. But what am I going to do? Where, to whom shall I go? Scripture talks about at times. Where are we going to go, God. Because at the end of the day, it's submitted faith. It's this unconditional-like faith that I think catches the attention of God. Um, I, I, as, I've, as I've had children, it's got me more, um, brought me more understanding of, the, the, of God the Father as a, as a heavenly Father in our life. Because, you know, when you have kids, you, you see all of a sudden a world you never saw before. And uh, I have a, my twin-year-olds, they're nine now, one of them, his name's Kellen. The other day, he came up to me, and he says, Dad, he goes, I love you, Dad. I said, son, I love you too, man. You're awesome. You're awesome. I punched him. It was great. And so uh, he, and he was like, uh, Dad, he goes, if you give me a candy, I will love you forever. <laughs> you ever had, like, any of your kids ever do that? Like, do that with you? They kind of make a deal because they're trying to get, you know, something from you. And I was laughing. I was like, son, I'm not going to give you a candy, but will you love me forever anyway? And he was like, and he walked away and got mad, you know, <laughs> played with this fidget spinner or whatever. And so, um, but I find it interesting is a lot of times we're like that with God. Like we're conditional. Like, hey, God, if you do this, man, I'll be your boy forever. Like if you just give me that parking spot in front of Macy's, I'm telling you, right? You, 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 I'm here, I'm yours. And I think Jesus shows us that there's this faith connection with him. That, that says, God, if you gave me nothing else, that God, if you never remove me from this garden, that God, if, you, if, if, if this never stopped, I'm not going anywhere. And it was when he did that, remember, again, what, what he did on Thursday that brought him to his, his moment on Sunday. It's this submission type faith. It's this unconditional type faith. It's this faith that says, I believe you are who you said you are, and you can do what you said you can do. And God, you're big enough to fix this, but even if you don't, it's all good. It's all good. So my question to you about the submitted type faith is, where are you with some of those things? Have you ever read the Bible and read something and go, I don't agree with that? Anybody read the Bible? I read every time I read the Bible, most of the Bible I don't agree with. Let's just be honest. Human nature says the last thing I want to do is sacrifice for others, human wise. 
The last thing I want to do is be a giver. The last thing I want to do is love my wife as Christ loved the church. I want my wife to love me in spite of all my imperfections. I want, I want everything opposite of Jesus. And you and I are probably similar because we're both human beings. And so what's interesting about the Bible is to me, anybody always says to me, man, I can't follow the Bible. I don't believe any of that stuff anyway. I go, man, I agree with you. I totally understand. But it's not about you agreeing. It's about you submitting. And when you submit is when you actually release the blessings of God. I don't believe that a lot of the times I, we, we teach ministers about giving. People always say like, man, give and it shall be given to you. That makes no sense. Right? Like, if I give you, somehow I'm going to receive. That makes no sense, but in God's economy, it does. And so when you learn to submit to his ways, his blessings come to you. So my encouragement to you would be, you don't need to agree with the Bible to do it. Just start with loving Jesus and following the ways that he goes. And I promise you, you'll start to see that the submitted faith will release blessings inside of your life. So if you're held up and hung up on the idea like, I got to completely believe to follow Jesus, you, 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 you're completely mislong. You're wrong. Because even the disciples, if you go back and read the Bible, even they didn't believe to follow Jesus. They had years of ministry experience with Jesus, and the Bible says, oh, and then they believed. It's like, what were you doing the whole couple years before? <laughs> well, they followed before they... But why? Because it's submitted faith. They submitted to a man, to a presence, to a belief system, to a way of life that ultimately brought about blessing. Submitted type faith will ultimately get you to your number, th- to number three, and this is this, it's unshakable faith. Unshakable faith. So you have collective faith, submitted faith, unshakable faith. Verse 45 says, and when he rose from prayer, he came to the disciples and found them sleeping. Now, has that ever happened to you? Where you had somebody like, they had your back, and then all of a sudden you went to them because they said they had your back, and then you went to them to cash in, and they weren't there? Has anybody ever been betrayed? Anybody ever been backstabbed? Anybody ever been talked about? Anybody ever like the people? And they were the closest to you, right? They were supposed to be there. They knew your situation. As a matter of fact, they used their, your situation to hurt you. And that's nobody in here because, you know, other people, right? And, and, and it's a moment when, when the circumstances just kind of throw you for a loop where small faith says circumstances determine my faith and big faith. Jesus here shows us, she, he says, he kind of shows us that actually my faith determines my circumstances, kind of flips it around. There's a great story where, where Peter, you know, he's on the boat and Jesus is walking on water and he calls Peter out. And it, it's, of course it's Peter because, you know, Peter's got a big mouth and he's really, you know, strong and he wants to be the leader and that one ahead. And so he gets out of the boat and I find it interesting that Jesus, that, that, that Jesus says, come, come, Peter. Again, remember, Jesus said it, so then you can believe it because he is who he said he was and you can do what he said he can do. Faith is not just believing. Faith is agreeing with God because God said something, so now you can bank on it. And so Jesus speaks to Peter. Peter stands up and steps, one of the only two people ever recorded in history to walk on water. And Peter does something miraculous, and he's doing amazing things, and he has faith in Jesus. And then all of a sudden... He looks at the wind and the rain, and uh, what is that? That's circumstance. He's looking at all the things around him, taking his eyes off the one person, removing his faith from God, saying all the things that he could be. Now he's seeing all the things that could be and might happen, and now he's worried and he's full of anxiety, and you see in Scripture records that he starts to what? He sinks. And I find it so fascinating Maybe it's just me. It's a story of how we are with God. Is that you have this miraculous moment where Jesus calls you and you do some really cool things with God. And if you've been with, walking with Jesus for any length of time, you might have a moment where you, 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 you take your eyes off of him and we do it every day in some way. We, we turn our backs to Jesus whether it's with what we watch or see or feel or how we act or what we do with our money or whatever it is. And Jesus calls us to him and we turn our back to Jesus. And there's this beautiful moment where as Peter is sinking, only Jesus, you know, and he walks up and he, he, only Jesus walks up to people who betray him. Only Jesus walks up to people who, who, who completely turn their back on him and 
And, and the Bible says that he reaches out his hand. And, and remember, language is important. He reaches out his hand and he lifts him up and he says, Peter, you of little what? What was it? Yeah. It wasn't you of little obedience. Peter, if you would have just been better, if you would have just crossed all the T's and dotted all the I's, if you were a better Christian, Peter, you could have walked on water. You have been tap dancing, watching people. You've just been crazy. He said, you have little faith. Why? Why? Why did he use the word faith? It's because faith in the moment of circumstance that's unshakable. Come on, church. That when, you, when something doesn't happen and doesn't go your way, and yet it doesn't affect how you believe, it doesn't affect what you believe about God because you still agree that he's amazing. It's faith that allows you to walk on water. It's the miracles that are in your life right now that might, the only way they're going to get released is if you, you have some level of unshakable faith. And number four is this, and then I'm done, and we can eat. And we can watch the dubs. Was it dunk on LeBron? I like LeBron, okay? I know I'm not, I don't want to turn the crowd to me. I like LeBron. But I like the dubs too. And it's, it's funny. It's like you move away and now all of a sudden they're good. How does that make any sense? I had a moment. Sorry. Number four, healing faith. Verse 15, he says, And one of them struck the servant of the high priest with the cut off his right ear. Of course, we know who this now later was Peter. Big mouth. And so, uh, but Jesus said, no more of this. And he touched his ear and he healed him. And y'all ever heard this statement? Um, hurt people, hurt people. Y'all ever heard that? Like, it's like a great statement. And it's a, it's a good statement because it reveals the nature of humans. And he says, it, it, well, what it says, it says, if you are hurt, you now have the license and the excuse to hurt others. So if you do hurt someone, it's okay, they're hurt. You ever, you ever seen that? It's like, because the truth is a lot of times hurt people do hurt people. Jesus in his moment of great pressure, in fact, Garden of Gethsemane is actually a great translated press. It's a, Gethsemane is actually the word press. It's where they would uh, press the olives and actually create olive oil. It was the place of, it was the Valley of Kidron. If actually, you actually looked throughout, throughout the, the Bible, you can see that this actually area is in the Old Testament, it's in the New Testament, and it's not in, in, in both areas on accident, it's on purpose, because it's a place where there, people would have pressure, plus a place of death, place of, of, of pain, of issues, of anxiety, of depression. It was the worst place. And Jesus is in that. Again, this is Jesus' toughest moment up until now. He's in a place of pressure, pain, anxiety, hurt, feelings, depression, betrayal. Come on. And Jesus is hurt. And the Bible says he goes up and he heals the man that Peter attacked, which tells me only this, that at the end of the day, one of the main characteristics of Jesus-like faith, if you want principles and promise brought into your life, yes, hurt people hurt people in the world, but Jesus' faith says hurt people heal people. Because Jesus was the one person who was hurt the most that picked up the ear and healed the man who came to attack. Again, remember, Jesus, only Jesus does this. You and I, we would have cut off the other ear. <laughs> Where's that? What other things we could take? But only Jesus stands up there and says, actually, in my kingdom, to release the blessings that I have for people, when you're hurt, your responsibility as a Christian is to heal others. Have you ever found that when you're hurting and that when you're going through something and when you're depressed and when you're hurt, when, when, when it's all about you and then you take a step to make it all about someone else, all of a sudden you start to feel good? That's part of the reason why that you serve at a church. It, it, it doesn't have anything to do with you doing a favor for the church. As a matter of fact, the church, it's just like Jesus. Jesus invites us into something, and we think it's for him. It's like when Jesus asks a question, we think he's asking a question because he lacks information. He's God. He doesn't ask a question because he doesn't know the answer. He asks a question because he's trying to get something to you. So whenever God asks something of you, the principle inside Scripture, and you should put this in your heart, if God ever asks something from you, it's not actually from you, it's actually for you. And so when Jesus says that you should heal others in your pain, it's not so that you can help someone else, it's really to help you. 
And that's why you find when you're generous and you're a giver and when you're able to give everything that you have away, that's why you feel better. It's not a coincidence. It's because God created you and he knows how you work. Because hurt people might hurt people in the world, but in the kingdom, hurt people heal people. Jesus went out of his way to heal those around you. And I'm going to close with this thought. You know, at the end of the day, all of us struggle with this tension that I talked about today. Is how do you how do you believe when you can't see it? And I, I really believe this that inside of Jesus' toughest moment, collective faith, right? It's just that ability for us to connect with others around us that we're gonna have to borrow someone else's faith to get us somewhere. Submitted faith, it's this idea that, hey, listen, I would no matter what happens, God, even when those who around me betrayed me, and even the circumstances and all the things that are in. God, you are going to show up and make something. God, you're going to show up and make something happen on my behalf. That no matter what happens, you're going to do it. Unshakable faith is this idea that just, you mean, God, no no matter what circumstances, God, if I see the wind, I see the rain, no no big deal. But submitted faith and and then then just this idea of healing faith. That at the end of the day, if you're hurting right now and if you're in your garden, the best thing you can do for yourself is to help others and get your mind off of you and help other people. Everybody bow your head and close your eyes in here right now. I just want to pray for our faith. I want to pray that today, maybe we can take a step in the right direction towards Jesus-like faith. Maybe you and I can together, today, we can maybe make a stand and say, today on this Sunday, we can walk out of here and not have the faith of us, but have the faith of Jesus to where we can truly believe and grow in maybe one, two, or three, or maybe all parts of these these aspects, to truly get to the principle and the area that we need to get to. So let's pray. God, we love you. Thank you that that you sent Jesus to give us the ultimate example of faith, that you sent your son, God, to go through, not just be God on earth, but be fully man and fully God. So he struggled and he he had pressure and he had to uh, figure out what to do with anxiety and depression and hurt. And in the moments of his toughest part of his life, God, he shows us and reveals to us the characteristics of faith like him that will ultimately bring about our resurrection Sunday, will ultimately bring about our purpose in life. And God, if anybody under the sound of my voice is missing their purpose right now because we are missing out on the faith, having faith like Jesus, I pray that you would supernaturally right now Help us to be better in every one of those areas. Help us to be more like Jesus, not more like the church, not more like people, not more like self-help books. God, more like your son, Jesus, because when we can align our life and live like you, it's not our obedience that catches you, the attention of you. It's our faith. And so I pray for that to happen in this place, in Jesus' name. And everybody say amen, amen. Give God a hand clap of praise in this place. Come on.